Good morning. Welcome to our community of Calgary Unitarians. It's good to have so many of you with us this morning after Reverend Deborah's wonderful retirement party last night. And to all of those who have mothers or are mothers, happy Mother's Day. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on your journey of faith or search for meaning, welcome. If you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time, know that we are grateful to have you with us. As our statement of purpose says, we come together in beloved community to grow in wisdom, 
welcome and deepen relationships and act for a just and sustainable world. Now, wherever we are, let us remember and acknowledge the traditional territories and languages of all those whose ancestors were here before us. We recognize our responsibility to be stewards of this land and acknowledge that we do so in cooperation with the people of the Blackfoot Confederacy for whom this Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta is traditional territory. The people of the Blackfoot Confederacy are comprised of the Sikzika, Akani, and Gaina First Nations, as well as the Dene First Nation band, Tsukdena, and the Nakoda First Nation, also known as Stoney. Alberta's Nakoda First Nation comprises three bands, Bears Paw, Chenakee, and Wesley. Mokentis, the Blackfoot word for what is now known as the city of Calgary, is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. In offering a land acknowledgement, we honor those who have long been the stewards and accept our shared responsibility for being good caretakers. We acknowledge that Treaty 7, signed September 22, 1877, was entered into as a collaboration between settlers and indigenous peoples, making us all treaty people. My name is Alan Wall. I have the privilege of serving on your board of trustees, and I prefer the traditional pronouns, they, them. The Calgary Unitarians community is special to me because here I feel at one with a timeless community of souls, each free to believe what reason and insight reveal is true. And as Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. wrote, a moment's insight is sometimes worth a life's experience. And now for some important announcements. Great news. Five candidates, including two Canadians, have applied to be considered for our Calgary interim minister position. Our team is now busy checking references and planning Zoom interviews. We hope to have news for you by May 20th. Today is the last day to register for the National Online Canadian Unitarian Council Conference being held next weekend, May 15th and 16th. Come for the entire weekend conference or just a few workshops. There's a sliding scale available from $5 to 150, so it is affordable for all of us. You can get full details at the website, cuc.ca. That's cuc.ca. But today is the last day to register. Lastly, we have just been told by the Canadian Unitarian Council that we will soon receive a $4,200 grant to help with additional pur purchases needed for doing multi-platform services and events. We owe a special thank you to Pam Rickey, who led our application for this Sharing Our Faith grant. Well done, Pam. After the service, please stay for coffee time, where you can catch up with our community and friends in small virtual breakout rooms. Now to Pam Rickey for the lighting of our chalice. We light our chalice today with the words of Leslie Takahashi, Labyrinth. Walk the maze within your heart. Guide your steps into its questioning curves. This labyrinth is a puzzle leading you deeper into your own truths. Listen in the twists and turns. 
Listen in the openness within all searching. Listen, a wisdom within you calls to a wisdom beyond you. And in that dialogue lies peace. Welcome. I am so glad you've joined us this morning. I'm Lynn Nugent, a member of the Calgary Unitarians, and Pam Rickey and I are your service leaders today. The idea for service about the spirituality of walking the labyrinth came from worship arts team member, Laura Shannon. Thank you, Laura, for that inspiration. Pam and I've enjoyed our own exploration of the labyrinth path as we put together our service today. <clears throat> as is our practice, we begin, uh, and this is a practice established by our Reverend Deborah, Minister Emeritus now, um, by starting our service in gratitude. It takes a skill of many folks to make a Zoom service happen. And as I've said before, if the technical aspects of bringing the service to you were in my hands, oh, not much would be happening this morning, my friends. So thank you so much to our tech team of Hendrik and Christopher, to Ev for PowerPoint, to Bob, who will put our service on YouTube, Doug for managing the coffee rooms this morning, Alan, for greetings from the board, Jane for bringing us music and song, and Sheila for sharing news from the children and youth program. And now to our music director, Jane Perry. Good morning, friends. It's good to be together with you in this virtual space once more. All of the songs we're going to sing together this morning are songs that are about finding the stillness within and listening to that still small voice that helps us understand who we are and who we need to be in this world. We're going to start with a song called Find the Stillness, which is not one that we sing often in our congregation, uh, but a very beautiful one. There are two verses. The melody is exactly the same. So if this is a new one for you, feel free to listen to the first verse and then jump in on the second verse when you feel more comfortable. Find a stillness. everyone. It is so great to see all of you on Mother's Day. And my name is Sheila McMaster, Director of Religious Education, and my pronouns are she and her. And I'm very excited about today. Um, this week, the children and youth are going to be testing out a number of different finger labyrinths set to relaxing meditation music. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And if you want to check out this week's children and youth newsletter, 
Um, I have over 10 finger labyrinths in there with their meanings that you can test out at home as well. Uh, also this week, we're gonna be sharing stories of mothers and mother figures in your lives, recognizing that some people might not have a biological mother right now, but a mother of their heart that they want to honor today. And Mother's Day is also a day of feeling sad um, for some people or a day of remembrance. Perhaps they have a loved one who has passed away or it might be a day of mixed feelings if perhaps you had a difficult relationship in your life. And so I want this to be a day where we honor all of those feelings on Mother's Day. And for Mother's Day, I'd like to share six true stories from Reader's Digest that I thought were just the best. So this first one's called My Favorite Barista by Jennifer Stockberger. It says, one morning I jokingly told my husband he dropped the ball because he did not make me coffee and I was having trouble getting motivated to start my day. And my five-year-old son overheard me and asked me to explain what does drop the ball meant? A few minutes later, he came into our room holding an overflowing coffee mug and dishcloth underneath to catch the drips. He said to my husband, you dropped the ball, but I picked up the ball. And he handed me the worst tasting, most watered down, but sweetest cup of coffee ever. This next one's called No Boys Allowed by Karen Duger. Upon attempting to prepare my seven-year-old daughter for a new baby in a few months, she repeatedly stated, no boys in our house. After several months, the big day arrived and my daughter came into the hospital room and I told her the baby was a boy and asked her, what are we gonna do? And she placed both hands on her hips and without missing a beat said, well, I guess we'll just have to love the little thing. This next one's called Saint Nick by Brenda Balker. <clears throat> my six-year-old son, Nicholas, sat in the grocery cart as I perused the canned vegetables. How about this one, mommy? He asked and handed me a can of asparagus. I love asparagus, I told him. Asparagus is my favorite vegetable, but it's just too expensive. I put the can back on the shelf. Three months later, I opened a crudely wrapped present from under the Christmas tree, and it was a can of asparagus. Nicholas beamed in delight as he explained how he had saved his pennies to buy me the best Christmas gift I'd ever received. Oh, and this one reminded me of my own childhood. When I was seven, I saved all my allowance money for months and months and months, and I bought my mom a bar of Yardley Lily of the Valley soap, and I was so proud of that soap. So when I read that story, I was like, yes, that's what I did for my mom. Um, this next one's called A Stand-Up Woman by Robin Hines. My mom had a great sense of humor and a knack for making everything fun. One thing that resonated with me, even as a small child, was how much she seemed to enjoy her own company and found ways to entertain herself. As a kid, I remember her giggling while paying bills. What was so funny about paying bills? She would put humorous notes in the reference section of the check. For the electric bill, she might put, you light up my life. Or for the mortgage, she'd write, four shingles closer to owning it all. And I thought, I got to start doing that. That sounds like a lot of fun. This next one's called Memories in Verse by Patty Whitty. The day I was dreading had arrived. It was inevitable. I had seen it coming, but had chosen to ignore it for as long as possible. My very capable, intelligent mom had started forgetting to pay her bills, and it was time to take over her finances. As I looked through her wallet, I made the remarkable discovery Tucked away in a tiny compartment were four Mother's Day poems I had written her in the 1960s, and she had saved and cherished those simple gifts for over 50 years. What a happy surprise. And our last story for about mothers today is A Scarlet Symbol by Priscilla Hartling. My mother was my best friend. She loved cardinals, the male red ones. When she got sick with pancreatic cancer, and knew her death was near, she told me to always look for the red cardinal. That would be her. I never paid too much attention to that statement. I was too busy becoming an adult. 25 years later, every time I feel at my wit's end, there's a cardinal flying past me or in a nearby tree. Is it a coincidence or is my mother, all these years later, letting me know that everything will be okay? I'll take the latter. My own mom is 75 years old and she moved in with me last June and I have a wonderful daughter who's 10. So we have three generations of mothers and daughters in our house today. 
And so the present I'm going to give myself for Mother's Day is to just be present, to put away my cell phone and enjoy today because today is a day that will never come again. And I want to cherish it. And I want to say happy Mother's Day to all of you or however you hold this day of mothers in your heart. And now to Lynn. Thank you, Sheila. <clears throat> Those are wonderful stories. I really enjoyed hearing them. <clears throat> We're going to begin our labyrinth exploration this morning with videos recorded for a class project by Laura Shannon. Laura is currently working on a master's in public and pastoral leadership in spiritual care at the Vancouver School of Theology, and she's also on our worship arts team. She has generously offered to share her videos, articulating her research and her reflections on labyrinths. So that's why the introductory video begins by addressing her classmates rather than the congregation. So for this morning, we're going to consider ourselves Laura's classmates. And now Laura will introduce us to Walking the Labyrinth through her two videos. Hello, my wonderful classmates. One of the tools that I use for grounding and honoring my innermost self is meditation. There are so many ways to meditate, and one of the best for me is walking or movement meditation. I love sitting meditation in the early morning hours, but during the day, I find I am more easily distracted and incorporating movement helps. The labyrinth is an ancient set of symbols that can be used as a meditation tool. There are many different designs, but they are all unicursal. This means that unlike a maze, there's only one path to and from the center and they have not been designed as a puzzle or a challenging exercise. This is a finger labyrinth, and it is a replica of the famous Chart Cathedral Labyrinth designed uh, and built into the floor of the 800-year-old cathedral in France. Like the walking labyrinth, you can use this as a meditative tool while running your finger along the path, like this. We have a beautiful labyrinth in our neighborhood that also uses this design. My husband and I were ecstatic when we found it shortly after we moved here in 2012. Before he and I met, we had both discovered and had had amazing experiences walking the labyrinth. He has used this meditation with patients at a hospital and forensic psychiatry center in his work as a spiritual care provider for more than 15 years. I find each time I walk the labyrinth is a different experience. Before I begin, I take a moment to close my eyes and slow my mind. Sometimes I bring an intention of problem solving or letting go of a stress or frustration in my life. Sometimes I just focus on walking slowly and being present to the feel of the path under my feet. I have also taken a small stone or a bunch of sage with me, breathing a worry or concern into them as I walk to the center and leaving them there for the earth to take care of, feeling lighter as I walk back out. Often metaphors for life come to me while I'm walking. I have felt that I have journeyed to the center of myself, received guidance, and taken that back out into the world. I have also felt that the twists and turns of the labyrinth, like those on my life journey, have taken me away from spirit and then back again. When using the finger labyrinth, I like to close my eyes and focus on my breath. I use my non-dominant hand to activate the creative, creative, intuitive side of my brain. Following the winding path and pausing in the middle is very much like walking the labyrinth, but of course, it takes a lot less time. So I will do it several times and find it is helpful in keeping my attention on the meditation and easier to let my thoughts float away 
like leaves swirling and gliding down a stream. These forms of meditation are important because they allow me to access a less rational realm of being. They give space for creativity, connection, and a connection to flow into my existence. And from this creative and sacred place, I can go back into my life, solve problems and nurture relationships in a much calmer and open-hearted way. I hope you enjoy my PowerPoint presentation, which includes photos of labyrinth designs throughout the ages and labyrinths that my family and I have visited over the years. I hope you have a chance to experience this amazing walking meditation. And remember, there is no right way to walk the labyrinth. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to post them or contact me. Thank you. And welcome to my labyrinth slideshow. This is a photo of the gorgeous labyrinth at the Vancouver School of Theology. Dr. Lauren Artress is the author of this wonderful book, Walking a Sacred Path. She is also the founder of Veriditis, a nonprofit dedicated to teaching people about the labyrinth as a tool for transformation and growth. I will read two of my favorite quotes from the book. The labyrinth is a spiritual tool meant to awaken us to the deep rhythm that unites us to ourselves and to the light that calls from within. In surrendering to the winding path, the soul finds healing and wholeness. Based on the circle, the universal symbol for unity and wholeness, the labyrinth sparks the human imagination and introduces it to a kaleidoscopic patterning that builds a sense of relationship. It enlivens the intuitive part of our nature and stirs within the human heart the longing for connectedness and remembrance of our purpose for living. The labyrinth is thought to have been used for over 4,000 years in various ways, all over the world. As this poster points out, the labyrinth is an archetype, a divine imprint found in religious tradition in various forms around the world. By walking the labyrinth, we are discovering a long forgotten mystical tradition. Although it is difficult to determine the exact age of this rock art, it is estimated they were made between 2500 and 1800 BCE. The association of a number of these Galatian labyrinths with carvings of deer and other wild animals is also of considerable interest. Maybe these petroglyphs are hunter's art, perhaps magical symbols for the hunt. See the article, The First Labyrinths, by Jeff Saward in the links under my sources for more information. Nordic magic. The last man to use this labyrinth for sorcery in Kugorin, Sweden, passed away in 1963. It is thought that he used it to ensure his sons, who were fishermen, would return home safely. John Kraft traveled to the Nordic countries to do research about how the labyrinth was used in local pagan ceremonies. He found many rock labyrinths and heard stories of how they were used, including controlling the wind to ward off bad weather and to protect herders from wolves. See the article on magic by John Craft under my sources for some fascinating stories. As I mentioned in my introduction, my husband and I were delighted to discover this beautiful labyrinth in our own neighborhood. We were blown away when we arrived one day to find the thyme blooming in a brilliant purple. 
This is a photo that I took of a friend walking the Nose Hill Labyrinth. It is my favorite in Calgary. It is right in a huge park in the center of our city, and I try to get there a few times every summer. There are so many patterns and materials you can use to create a labyrinth. In the hospital my husband works at, he projects a light labyrinth, like the one on the top left, onto the floor in the chapel during certain times of the week. He created a labyrinth like the one underneath with his patients at the Forensic Psychiatry Center out of twigs and rocks found in the forest nearby. The one on the top right is a labyrinth printed on canvas that can be rolled out during their walk and then easily put away in storage when they are finished. The bottom right is a photo of the labyrinth at High Park in Toronto, painted right on the cement. You can find labyrinths in both indoor and outdoor settings, in parks, near churches, in churches, and in many healthcare settings. This is another form of finger labyrinth that my husband built with clay to use for meditation. We have discovered and searched out labyrinths all over North America. This labyrinth is carved into rock at the Hollyhock Retreat Center on one of the islands off the coast of Vancouver. This one is in a beautiful park in Nelson, BC, right on the Kootenai Lake where we love to camp every summer. It's been fun to watch my daughters grow up visiting labyrinths on our family vacations. They used to be so excited and run the path in and out as fast as they could. This is the first one that my older daughter did slowly with intention. There are many ways to walk the labyrinth, ways unique as each person who comes to walk. This sign was painted by one of the women in our neighborhood. Again, it's a great metaphor for life and encourages us to respect the diversity of ways that each of us walks our own path. As we go into our meditation this morning, we do it to the words of, um, so I'll just say, we'll listen to some words, then we'll have a couple of minutes of silence, and then there'll be a video musical response. So we go into our, our meditative space with an excerpt from Labyrinth Poem by Suzanne Moody. The, la the labyrinth awaits the sojourner, almost calls her name. Will you enter my simple boundaries and journey my paths? one step at a time. Straight ahead, yet winding and crooked, the curled road beckons to be trod, reinforcing the uplifted, blessing the downtrodden. Maybe tears, maybe joy, maybe peace, one step at a time. All who are heavy laden, come stand at the gate. All who are fragmented, place one foot down and the other in front. All who find wonder in the commonplace, come travel the narrow roads, rows one step at a time. Give up your burdens, your middle of the night worries. Lay a care on a silver craggly rock as you pass and move on to the next. The monotony will soothe you one step at a time. Moving inward, the trail winds in and out, muscles untensing. The walker's job seems easy, the cares tumble down and hit the ground with imagined force, lightening the load on contact, one step at a time. The twist inward, the transformation outward, a fresh view from fatigued eyes, all part of the simple design of much complexity, 
with the whole greater than the sum of the steps, all while traveling one step at a time. I am sending you light to heal you, to hold you. I am sending you light to hold you in love. I am sending you light to heal you, to hold you. I am sending you light to hold you in love. I walk the path with you. Go slow, dear one, don't hurry. I'll go just like you need to go. There is no need to worry. Cause I am sending you light to you, to hold I am sending you light to hold you in love. I am sending you light to heal you, to hold you. I am sending you light to hold you. Let us take time to tend the bonds of care and compassion in our community. We who are gathered here in this virtual space, each bring our own challenges, concerns, joys and milestones. We understand ourselves to be part of a vast interconnected web of existence. What befalls one of us? befalls us all. <clears throat> As we gather this morning, we acknowledge our many concerns, both personal and in the wider world. Here in Calgary, the third wave intensity has resulted in greater lockdowns, meaning greater isolation and economic struggle for many folks. These are challenging times with many uncertainties, and so many of us are exhausted. Some of us are struggling with fear for ourselves, family, and friends. Let each of us take time now to name out loud or to hold in our hearts all those who are struggling. May we also hold ourselves with compassion as we light our candle of concern. In the midst of the challenge of our times, there's also gratitude and joy. We mark birthdays, anniversaries, and other celebrations such as Mother's Day, reminding ourselves that there are reasons to show gratitude. I wasn't sure <clears throat> whether to include this in global candle or candle of joy, but I have such gratitude and joy for the adoption of the eighth principle by the CUC that it's going in with joy. It reads as follows. We, the member, of, me, <clears throat> the member congregations of the Canadian Unitarian Council, covenant to affirm and promote individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. May it be so. And I have so much gratitude for the farewell to Reverend Deborah 
the beautiful gifts, the music, the tributes. What a send off for our beloved minister's retirement. And I have been, a request came to Pam and I from Reverend Deborah this morning to express, and I quote, deep gratitude to all those who created such a joy-filled, meaningful celebration. Thanks to this community for our 11 years of shared ministry. <clears throat> so take time to name out loud. <clears throat> Excuse me. Take time to name out loud or in the silence of your heart what you give thanks for, no matter how small and what joys are present in your life today. Let us light our candle of joy. Today is Mother's Day in Canada, the United States and Australia. So this morning, let's honor birthing and nurturing in a broad sense, be it people who have physically given birth or those who have nurtured a project, a talent, or other people. Fill in your words for whatever or whomever you have nurtured and celebrated. Celebrate it for Mother's Day. Perhaps another way to honor Mother's Day would be to lift up the birthing metaphor used by Sikh activist Valerie Kaur. She asks, the future is dark, but is this the darkness of the tomb or the darkness of the womb? How do we labor for the world we want when the labor feels endless. This metaphor uses birthing imagery in a way that all people everywhere are included. With these words, we light our global candle. I'd now like to share with you a reflection on labyrinths. I've had a number of opportunities, <clears throat> excuse me, to walk labyrinths. Sometimes the experience has been a quiet, reflective walking meditation that's helped me relax my thoughts or relax and calm my body. Like the time our youth created an outdoor labyrinth using materials found at hand in nature during one of our congregational spiritual retreats or walking the labyrinth in the basement of Parkdale United Church after attending a workshop there, or walking the lovely outdoor labyrinth in Silver Springs, <clears throat> one of the labyrinths shown in Laura's slideshow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today I'm going to just share a short account of my most powerful labyrinth experience that occurred 11 years ago. Not only was it a very healing experience for me, but it illustrates a different way that a labyrinth might be used. A friend of mine, Verna, a healing touch practitioner, gave me a healing experience using the labyrinth at the High River United Church. It was May and a dear friend of mine was terminally ill and not expected to live much longer. I was holding tightly to the hope that she would make it through the summer. Verna set up her table at the center of the labyrinth and I walked the labyrinth slowly and mindfully. I held the intention to receive healing around my emotional pain as I anticipated and dare I say hope to control the timing of the impending death of my friend. Verna slowly walked behind me, reverently setting her intention to help me with healing for my highest good. When we reached the center, I climbed on the table and Verna gave me a treatment. As the treatment was ending, I could see in my mind's eye, my friend floating slightly above me. I could feel myself grasping her hands tightly. Then, I was filled with an overwhelming sense of love and I knew it was time to let her go. 
I released her hands, weeping as I did so. When Verna decided <clears throat> that I was grounded enough to safely leave the table, I walked slowly through the labyrinth to the exit, <clears throat> feeling a shift in my perception around my friend's circumstances and experiencing in my heart a sense of acceptance. Let's sing this song twice. And this one is called Voice Still and Small. Voice still and small, deep inside all, I hear you call, singing in storm and rain, sorrow and pain, still we'll remain singing. first labyrinth experience was at a New Year's Eve celebration, sometime back around the turn of the millennium, on False Creek in Vancouver in an old building called the Roundhouse, where I came upon a door with a sign, Labyrinth, please enter silently. So leaving the noise and excitement of the festivities outside, I entered and found myself in a magical space, dark, but for candles tracing a labyrinth coil, shadowy figures moving along the paths. A little hesitant and unsure, I removed my shoes and joined them. At first, I was distracted by thoughts of what I was supposed to be thinking, how slowly I had to move to avoid getting too close to the person in front of me, how to maintain my balance and not stumble into one of the candle lights. But it wasn't long before the magic overcame me and I became one with the rhythm, the shared meditative silence. My thoughts drifted off and I was in some otherworldly place where all of us, strangers when we entered, had become a single experience. Since that first time, I've taken the opportunity of walking labyrinths wherever I come upon one. I've never really searched them out. They just seem to show up at serendipitous moments. One was drawn in sand by a group of Unitarian women at their annual women's retreat. Now, most of the women were friends of long standing, while I, new to the church, knew no one, and I felt a bit like an interloper. After the dinner gathering on our first evening, everyone headed to the beach. And as the sun set red and gold over the ocean, we each entered the pathway. And once again, the magic happened. Individual relationships dissolved as an aura of symbiosis wrapped around the wholeness of us. And we emerged a unity, a circle of women gathered to leave the world outside as we shared a weekend of spiritual exploration, comfort and fun. Many years later, Robert and I were on our first long road trip together. 
We had been traveling for three months in our tiny camper van and were starting to get on each other's nerves. Now, when we're on the road, we watch for Unitarian churches and participate in Sunday services whenever we can. And what a blessing it was to find one at this stressful juncture. And what a surprise when someone told us of a labyrinth close by. After the service, we went searching and found it in a small, unkempt park. It was an earthen path outlined in stones with weeds growing up between them. In the silence of the afternoon, we each entered and began slowly treading this wild natural pathway, forgotten but faithfully awaiting those whose needs brought them there. As we placed one small step in front of the other, we regrounded and rebalanced and met each other in the center with our stress melted away and ready to restart our trip with a restored sense of purpose, curiosity, and energy. Our latest labyrinth experience was last November when we had to fly to California to sell our winter home. At that time, the Coachella Valley where our community is situated was the California COVID hotspot. So we were very nervous about traveling by plane, going out to buy food, going out to close our bank account and return our internet equipment, and then meeting with people to sign documents. And in four days, we had everything completed and anxious to leave as soon as possible, we headed to the airport two hours early. Then suddenly we realized we were passing the highway exit to the Unitarian Church of the Desert, our winter church away from home, and their beautiful, permanent paved outdoor labyrinth. Once again, a labyrinth was there for us just when we needed it. Once again, as we traced the winding trail, our tension melted, we regained balance and perspective and resumed our drive to the airport, relaxed, dismissive of our petty tribulations and grateful for our blessings. Now in researching labyrinths for this service, I've learned as Laura, Laura and, um, and Lynn told us that there's not just one in Calgary, several, but I'm so looking forward to the Botanical Gardens of Silver Springs to see that labyrinth outlined in purple time. That'll be my next labyrinth experience. <laughs> On your next labyrinth walk, ponder how our Calgary Unitarian community's mission is like a fire. It exists by burning, but a fire cannot burn without fuel. Your support is what fuels this community and its mission. 
And without your support, the flame of justice, community, and love cannot burn brightly as a beacon in the world. Please give as generously as you are able. Closing words, reflect back to what Lara told us about labyrinths. Labyrinths come in all sizes and patterns and are composed of all kinds of materials. Some are permanent, some are rolled out when needed and rolled back up and stored away in between times. Some are drawn on paper and traced for the fingertip. Sometimes a labyrinth is filled with people, occasionally children run around them, there might be one or two of you, other times just you on your own. People walk labyrinths to meditate, to work out problems, to release stress, to find meaning, to find their own centers, to join together or to have some space apart. Such a simple tool offering such a complex of experiences, enduring through centuries, often appearing just when we need them. Our problems come and go, but our divine nature, like the labyrinth, remains. Walking a labyrinth helps us return to the truth of that divine connection. in each 
each other's words Then our heart is in a holy place When our heart is in a holy place When our heart is in a holy place We are blessed with love and amazing grace When our heart is in a holy share the silence of sacred space and the god of our heart stirs within and we feel the power of each other's faith then our heart is in a holy place when our heart is in a holy place when our heart is in a holy place We are blessed with love and amazing grace When our heart is in a holy place When our heart is in a holy place We have not even to risk the adventure alone for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known and we have only to follow the thread. And when and where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a God. Where we had thought to travel outward, we will come to the center of our own existence. Where we had thought to be alone, we shall be with all the world. With these words by Joseph Campbell, we extinguish our chalice. May the light of our chalice illuminate our hearts until we meet again. As we end our time together this morning, may I invite all of us to attend our virtual coffee hour immediately following the service and the song benediction. This is a chance to talk together about things we've heard, thought, felt this morning, reflections on last night's retirement celebration for Reverend Deborah. We hope to see you at the virtual coffee hour. To get there, just click on the link that has just appeared in the Zoom chat area of your screen. And now let's sing together our song benediction. Thank you.